So as Joseph was talking about, this is a week of or season of Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is one of those one-day holidays that seems to kind of travel, mainly because of leftovers, right? So, <laughs> right? so a lot of you are going to go home today and you're going to have turkey something. You're going to have turkey with gravy, turkey pot pie, turkey sandwiches, turkey smoothies, whatever you can do to get rid of it, right? So the turkey's going to be gone as quick as you could try to get rid of it. But that's not what it's really about. It's kind of almost what it's turned into, but that's not what it's really about. It's that time that we're supposed to be thankful. We're supposed to set aside at least one day to kind of look back on the year and think about the things that we are thankful for. Even if our year has been a bad year, it's a time for us to be thankful for what we have and for moving forward. But all too often, I think that we see nowadays, because of commercialism, we see the meal as the thing that I can put into me to fuel me for what's coming next. Boom, Black Friday. I mean, isn't that us? Isn't that us as Americans? When people trample others for cheap goods mere hours after being thankful for what they already have? Isn't that us? Look at that lady behind the first lady. She looks like a Viking getting ready to go into a battle, doesn't she? She's going to get the television. I know it. She's got that look on her face. If any of these people resemble you, it's probably why you're here today. Black Friday. And it's, it's slipping. It's encroaching. I mean, we, and I love Christmas, but I still hold to the tradition that Christmas doesn't go up at my house at least until the meal's put away on Thanksgiving. We, we kind of forget about this time. I don't know if it's because we don't, you can take that down now, that scares me. You can take, uh, it's, if, if it's because we, we don't want to think about Thanksgiving in that way, sometimes Thanksgiving's a burden. Who's the one that cooks the meal in here? You spend 16 hours cooking the meal, Right? And the rest of us sit down for 15 minutes and we're like, whoa, that was good. I'm going to go out and watch the game. <laughs> you know, it's, you wonder sometimes why. But why is because this is a time when we are supposed to be thankful. I always know when I speak in front of the church that, that there is a wide variety of belief systems here, at least places where you are in your belief. There are oftentimes people sitting in the congregation that do not believe at all. There are people sitting here who want to believe, but just can't. There are some people here that, that believed, but because of some event have lost a little of that belief. And then there's those of us who, who just believe. They're all varieties of people. So when I start to talk about thankfulness, I have to wonder in my head, okay, who is it that we're thankful to? Why are we thankful and where does that thankfulness or that gratefulness go? If you're not a believer, maybe it's fate. Maybe you think it's the universe. Maybe you think that this last year you just had some good luck or bad luck. Or maybe you think that because of your own hard work, you are in the place where you are. And for that reason, you can be thankful. There's, there's just all kinds of areas of thankfulness. But if you're a believer... If you're a follower of Jesus, a Christian, then you have to believe that the recipient of your thanks, your gratefulness, is God. That's it. It's God. And when you do believe that, when you finally do believe that that is the place where your thankfulness belongs, then you start to understand that your thankfulness is rooted or you can identify it th through grace. It's connected to grace. It's the fact that we receive something that we may not deserve, and yet we get it anyway. That's, that's what grace is all about. And I can personally identify with grace, because every good thing that I have in my life came to me in spite of me, not because of me. I can mess some things up. I mean, I can really mess some things up along the way. And then I look back and I say, wow, my life really kind of turned out okay. Thank you, God for always picking me up and always bringing me to this place. Does it mean I don't have hard times? No, we all do. We all have hard times. We're all going to suffer hard times. But we can be thankful for the things that we have around us. Now, there is a difference in the gratitude that we show to God than the gratitude that we show to one another or to people. When we receive something from another person for nothing, asking nothing in return, it's a rare thing. 
Now, there are times throughout the year that you can expect to receive a gift. Your birthday comes along, you can expect that somebody will probably give you a gift. The older you get, your expectations get smaller during that time, right? <laughs> Some of us would like the birthdays just to go away at a certain point, right? But that's a time that you can expect a gift. Christmas, Christmas is coming up. Those of us that are looking forward to celebrating Christmas, we have an expectation of possibly receiving a gift. My grandson, he puts out a list several months ahead of time and distributes it to the family. His expectation of receiving gifts is pretty high. I mean, he's, he's, he's got that expectation. And because he's younger, he's probably going to get that. But the thought of us getting a gift because it's Tuesday, that kind of blows our minds a little bit. Somebody comes up to you on a Tuesday and says, hey, I was thinking about you. I just want you to have this. And you may not say it out loud, or you might, but you're going to think this. You're going to think, oh, shoot, I didn't get you anything. We got this, this way of wanting to reciprocate, don't we? Somebody gives us something, we want to give them something. Maybe it's out of the goodness of our hearts. Maybe it's because we want to keep it even, right? We don't want them to have a gift over top of us, so we want to make sure that we gift at the same levels. I don't know what it's all about, but there is that thing that we want to reciprocate. Getting a gift for no reason is difficult because it doesn't often happen. I want to share with you guys this morning a scripture that hopefully will walk us through the, the idea of being thankful, this understanding of being thankful to God, and also showing the idea of receiving something when you didn't expect it at all. Maybe you didn't deserve it, but you got it anyway. And it's from the Gospels, it's a story of Jesus. It's from Luke 7, 11 through 17, if you wanted to follow along. It's the section, the title over it would be Jesus Raises the Widow's Son. And this is the widow of Nain. Some of you may have heard it that way too. I'm going to read through it. Soon afterward, Jesus obviously was somewhere else, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was the widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. And the dead boy sat up and he began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd as they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Well, when we read a scripture like that and we're talking about Jesus, we kind of expect these things, right? Right? Jesus walked around and he did miracles. That is a good bit of what the gospel story is. Jesus healing people. Jesus raising people from the dead. Jesus going and performing miracles, making bread for thousands of people. That's what Jesus did. In fact, in the Bible, only three times Jesus raises someone from the dead. And I say that only, right? Like it's not a big deal. He did that three times and two other times um, he was asked to do it for friends. And so this is an interesting story in that it's a little bit different in fact, Jesus just left a miracle where he healed the centurion's son, the Roman centurion's son, where the Roman centurion came to Jesus and said, or, or servant, will you heal my servant? And Jesus says, yeah, take me there. Centurion said, no, I believe you can do it from here. And Jesus was amazed at his faith and actually healed the servant. And then he's on his way to this town of Nain to do whatever it is he's going to do. And he sees the funeral procession coming out of the gate as he is going in the gate. It's a, it's a happenstance moment, it seems. And when he sees them, he does something amazing. He raises the son from the dead. The interesting thing about this miracle that is different from so many miracles that Jesus performs is that nobody asked him to do it. He just did it. Nobody said, hey, this is the widow's only son. Can you come over here and raise him from the dead? Jesus, I know you've done some amazing things. You did something just this morning. Can you come help us? It wasn't like that at all. They were going to be two ships passing in the wind. They were just going to go by each other without ever saying anything to each other, and yet something happened. 
Something was different about this, and Jesus stopped, and he raised him without ever being asked. Now, there's a couple of important things that I want to pull out of this scripture that I think we need today to understand this concept of thankfulness, how it is to be displayed with God. First, the young man who died was the widow's only son. When you see that little portion of that sentence, you may not realize just how important it is. You get the impression that the man was young, he had a lot of life left in him, and he was the only son of this woman. And this woman was a widow. So what that tells you is that this woman now is in a household where she has no men. Now maybe today that wouldn't be a bad thing. But back in the first century, to not have a man in the household meant that you did not have a provider in the household. This woman was looking at the end of her life as she knew it. The ability to make a living depended on either her husband, who was gone, which now fell to her son, who was also gone. She lost her only son. The widow lost her only son. She was hopeless. She was destitute at this point. She was probably thinking, I'm going to have to beg or rely on my family or hope that the church comes through and does something to take care of me. She has nothing at this point. There was no welfare system set up for widows at that time. The church helped when it could, but not all the time. So you've got to appreciate the hopelessness of this woman as she is walking out in this funeral procession. Second, when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. With that word compassion, we see that a lot when we talk about Jesus. That word is in a lot of sentences when Jesus is being talked about. He has compassion. And sometimes it's like this. His heart overflowed with compassion. Sometimes we see an overwhelming sense of compassion that Jesus has. And it's usually just before he helps somebody that we see this word come up. And what's interesting is, is the Latin for what that is, compassion, the word that is used there is actually splancha. Splancha. It's, it's the root of the word where we get spleen, kind of the center of us. And it's always used in this way when it's talking about Jesus having compassion, but it's also used when you use the word heartbreak. Have you ever had your heart broken? You don't feel it here, right? Where do you feel it? I mean, it's, it just, you just feel it in the gut. It's like somebody just punched you, right? And that's what this is talking about. Jesus has this feeling when he sees the widow who lost her only son, he has this overwhelming compassion for her. And that's an amazing thing if you think about it. I don't want to let this moment go by without us dwelling here for just a second. Because when you look at our God, who is a loving God throughout history, if you look at the God of the Old Testament, he has sympathy for his people. When they are in captivity, when they're down in Egypt, he has sympathy for them. We see that. And, and it's, it's a different word that's used in the Old Testament. When he, he looks upon them and he loves them and he remembers them and he rescues them and he saves them. God has sympathy for his people all throughout the Old Testament. But when he comes here, something different happens. And this is one of the greatest miracles in all of history. Now, I know the cross is an amazing miracle, and it's the place where each and every one of us was restored back to eternal life. I know that. We were saved at the cross. And I don't want to belittle that amazing miracle of God in any way. But the one in the Bible that blows my mind more than anything else is the incarnation. The idea that the creator of everything somehow slips into his creation. That just blows me away. I don't know how that happens, but there it did. And there was only one reason for that. And it's demonstrated right here. And it's why we see this word so often when Jesus goes about healing. It's so that God could come from a place of sympathy to a place of empathy. He not only feels sorry for you, he is now hurting with you. He's overwhelmed with compassion for this woman. 
He feels it. Isn't that amazing that we've got a Savior that feels what we feel? Seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, he looks down and he's not distant. He feels. He looks down and he says, I know what you're going through. I've been there. And so we take God from a place of sympathy and now he is in a place of empathy. I want you to remember that. Third thing. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it. Nowadays, not such a big thing. Whenever I do funerals and do committals, I will oftentimes lay my hand on the coffin and pray. That is a common thing. But in first century Judaism, it was not only uncommon, it just didn't happen. There's no way in the world a rabbi is going to walk up and touch a coffin because he would be instantly unclean. As far as the church was concerned, he would be unclean, and he would have to go through all kinds of ceremonial washings and all of this time before he could be with people again. And he couldn't even go to the temple until after a certain period of time, and he did so many different things because you weren't supposed to be associated with death in that way. And yet Jesus does the most amazing thing when it looks like he's doing almost nothing is he walks up and he touches the coffin. He just walks up and touches the coffin. He went completely against the rules of the church to have compassion for this family. Went completely against the rules of the church to have compassion for this family. I want you to think about that, those of us that are believers here today. I want you to remember this from this little moment here. Don't let the rules get in the way of love. Just don't let it happen. Right? I'm not asking you to step outside of Christianity or outside of the belief system of Christianity, but what I am asking you is not to let the rules get in the way of love. Jesus didn't. Fourth thing, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. I love that. I love that. There's the gift. There's the gift. An amazing miracle Jesus raises the boy from the dead, but what the real miracle was was the compassion that Jesus had for the widow, and he restores her son back to her because he knows that without him, she has nothing. She's destitute. And he gives the son back to her, a gift. The compassion that Jesus had was for the plight of the mother. And so he restored her son to her, immediately putting her in a place where she was no longer destitute, where she would no longer be a beggar. He restored the boy to life, but she was given her life and livelihood back to her. That was the gift that nobody expected would happen. And so when this gift was bestowed upon this widow, the very next thing that comes up is the final point in the scripture. God has visited his people today. The people praise God. When they see what Jesus did, that they say, wow, show me how you did that. No, they just praised God. They knew it was a miracle. They knew that God did this. They praised God. They knew that the recipient of their thanks was to be with God. He was the proper recipient for their gratefulness and for their thankfulness. Grace, seemingly coming out of nowhere without being asked, and changes a life. I want to tell you a story from my life. Hopefully you can associate with this. That, that is this same kind of story, this idea that grace coming out of nowhere changes a life. It's a it's a, a raising from the dead kind of story. When I was out, when I was early in ministry, I was a candidate for ministry at the time. And so I'm going through, I have to prove my way through all of this. I'm going to seminary, I'm doing all the things. But I was also in the military. So I was assigned from Fort Gordon to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Some of you guys may have been out in beautiful Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And while I was out there, the district superintendent from the Methodist Church here in Augusta called the district superintendent out in Sierra Vista to make sure they knew I was coming and that I was a candidate for ministry so I just couldn't slip in the back pew and pretend like I wasn't going to do anything. So when I got there, they knew I was coming. And the senior pastor met with me after the first Sunday when we got together and he said, hey, I hear you're a candidate for ministry. Yes, yes I am. Well, I kind of expected maybe you'll help us out here. Well, absolutely, pastor. I'll be glad to help you out here. Perfect. We have a spot for you because we need a pastor of congregational care. 
And I went, really? Because if any of you know me, really know me, know that when we sit down and have a conversation, I run out of words really quickly. I am not a one-on-one -on -one guy. I, I'll talk to a million people from here. All right, I'm good at talking at you. But talking to you is a little difficult for me. And so when I thought, why would you choose me for pastor of congregational care? Well, that's just the job we've got, and that's what you're going to do. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you came to the church for the first time, you were going to see me. When you came to the church for the first time and went home, you were going to see me on your front porch, usually with a loaf of bread handed to you. And if I was lucky, it was still warm because LaDonna made them every Sunday. We were very adventurous back in those days. <laughs> Not so much anymore. <laughs> if, if you were in the hospital, you were going to see me. If you were a homebound member of the church that couldn't get out anymore, you were going to see me. I was that guy. I was that guy that was going to go out and do all of the visitation, to sit down with the people and just have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with everybody in the church. It was horrible. <laughs> I mean, it, I, it was such a growing pain for me. I did not like it at all. I'm like, Lord, could you give me something else other than this? But no, he couldn't. For a year, I did that. One day, somebody walked into the church, and I looked over. I was at one side of the congregation looking over to the other side. It was about this big of a congregational areas. And I sized him up immediately because that was my job. When you came in and you were a young family, I immediately knew I needed to come talk to you about the children's ministry. If you had a young baby, I needed to show you where the changing tables were. If you were whatever. So I'm, I'm sizing him up. I see he's an elderly gentleman. He's all by himself. I figure he's widowed maybe. He's got a cane. He's walking way stooped over and very slow. He makes his way to somewhere in the middle of the, in the, middle of the, the area there and he sits down. I walk over and I start to think, this is an elderly, an elderly gentleman. Maybe we'll get him connected with some of the ministries in the church. Make my way to him. And then I see he's a very sick elderly gentleman. The kind of guy that looks like he's way into the stages of cancer kind of sick. His eyes were sunken back so far in his head I could hardly see him because of the shadows of his forehead. He had dark, dark circles under his eyes. His suit fit kind of like my sweater does here. You know, the shirt dangled so far from his wrist and his collar was so far out. He, he looked like a kid wearing his dad's suit. That's what he looked like. The suit was obviously too big. I figured the sickness probably did that to him. And as I got even closer to him, I realized another thing. He wasn't an elderly man. In fact, I found out later he wasn't much older than me. His name was John, and he didn't have cancer, he had AIDS. Now those of you who are younger here today do not remember when AIDS cropped up and we first noticed it in the 80s and the 90s, and nobody knew anything about it, and there were no cures, and there was no medicine, and people were dying left and right. John was one of these people. He had AIDS. He was dying. He looked like a skeleton with a suit on when I saw him. He looked terrible. And I will tell you that he terrified me a little bit. We didn't know enough about it, or I didn't know enough about AIDS to know what I could or couldn't do. And here I am, pastor of congregational care. It's my responsibility to care for John. That's my job, It's to care for John. And so I'm doing my job. I go over and visit him in his house. He invites me over. I'm paranoid. I get a drink of water. Is it going to be okay? If he sneezes, what happens? All these crazy things that we know a little bit better about now that we didn't know then. I was fearful of someone in my congregation whose responsibility was mine. It was my job. I was pastor of congregational care, and so I needed to stick with John. Another thing John liked to do was talk on the telephone. Now, we didn't have cell phones back then, or at least I didn't. And so I had that little cordless phone in the house, right? And I would hear that thing ring, and John would be on the other end. And we would start talking. Hey, John, how you doing? Well, I'm not doing well today, this, this, and this, and this. John was a talker. Man, John was a talker. He had me on the phone for hours. We were like, I mean, talking on the phone like high school sweethearts talk on the phone, right? <laughs> you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> but it wasn't like that. John would talk, and I ran out of words pretty quick. But it didn't matter. John kept talking. 
And LaDonna would hear me going, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's kind of how our conversations went. But I took those calls all the time because I was pastor of congregational care, right? It's my job. And so John would call like at 9 o'clock at night. And pastor of congregational care wasn't my only job. I was still in the military. So I'm up at 5 o'clock the next morning, and that phone would ring at 9, 9 9.30. Now look, I still go to bed at 10 o'clock at the very latest. Still good, because I still wake up at 4.45, dang army. And uh, <laughs> so I'm the same way out there. And he's calling, and I see the phone, and I hear it ringing. And you know what's going through my mind? That's John. I got to take that call. That's John. I've got to take the call, right? Pastor Congregation Care. It's, it's my job. I got to take the call. Take the call. I listen forever and ever. Goes on for a while. Because John had AIDS, he, of course, had hospitalization visits. That boy would take a mountain full of pills. I've never seen anybody have to take so many pills in my life. And he would end up in the hospital every once in a while for something. It's usually something else that gets you. And he would be there, and because he had such a complicated disease, Sierra Vista had such a small little hospital, he couldn't be seen in Sierra Vista. And so he had to go to Tucson. So now... When John's in the hospital and I get off of work at 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon and take off the uniform and put on the khakis and head my way up to Tucson an hour, an hour and a half to get to the hospital, walk up to the place where John is and sit down with him, and John's a talker. So I'm getting home and it's dark, an hour each way. Got to the point that I'd get scared that John was going to get sick and end up at the hospital again. It was tough. It was tough for me. So, he's at the hospital one more time. I'm like, okay. Got in the car, drove up. It was particularly late that day. Got there, and John was asleep. Laying in the bed, peaceful, looks great. And of course, rather than waiting for him to wake up, because I drove an hour and a half, I thought, ah, I'll just pull out my handy-dandy pastor's business card here. Write down, hey, John, I was here, you were asleep. Really hated that I missed you. I'll be praying for you. Left that card right there. Thought, I could get home. Hour later, I got home. Well, a couple days later, I get a phone call from his sister. I've never met his sister ever. Only met his mom and dad. Never met his sister. So I get this phone call from his sister, and she says, hey, I just want to let you know, John passed away. Story's hard for me. She said, John had a book, a little book. And in that book, he would write the names, the phone numbers, and a little something about all of his friends. And you were in the book, so I was going to call you and let you know your friend John passed away. He thought I was his friend. I was doing my job. I never thought of him as a friend. But that moment that his sister called me, that moment that that happened, I was raised from the dead. Death to myself, the obligation of ministry. I stopped having sympathy for John and people like John. I stopped feeling sorry for him and started living with them. I made me into a big baby. I cry all the time now. Commercial comes on. There's a kitten. (laughs) You see what I do? I make laughter, so I'll stop crying now. But that's what happened that day. I want you to remember that. That is the beauty of God. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son. Think about that little portion of John 3.16. God loved you so much that he wanted to stop feeling sorry for you and he wanted to come down and pitch his tent and live with you. Jesus had compassion over the people that he healed. Jesus had love for them. Jesus went the extra mile for them. He stayed up for them. He visited with them. He held them. He raised them. He did everything that he could while he was here. And then he finally died for them, for us. And then what he said was this, and this is what I didn't get until John taught me in his death when he was 
raised up to heaven. I'm going to leave you the church, said Jesus, and they're going to love you just like I do. They're not going to feel sorry for you. They're going to be empathetic with you. Man, that hits hard, doesn't it? Is that what we're doing? Is that how we're living? You know, when I heard that phone call, the only thing I can think of is that scripture that I just read to you. I could hear Jesus saying, I tell you, get up. And the dead boy sat up, began to talk, and that's me. I began not to talk at people, I began to talk with them. And I've been talking ever since. That moment changed me. The reason for our gratitude this morning is this. Our gratitude is rooted in grace, given to us by God, without us ever asking. God just happened to be walking by me that day, that day that I got that phone call, and he had compassion on me. And he used the most unlikely person in the entire world, a person dying of AIDS, It's amazing. So I'll leave you with this, church. Don't let the rules get in the way of love. Don't let anything get in the way of love. Let's pray.